Hi, Lily. Hi, Anna. <laughs> how do you kill a vegan vampire? I don't know, Lily. How would you kill a vegan vampire? You put a stake through their hearts. <laughs> That's the best I could find. Hi, I'm Anna. And I'm Lily. And this is Liliana's pre-read media tick. The podcast where we analyse and discuss audience preconceptions of media from a queer feminist lens. Yeah. Yeah. And in case you were confused by the first bit, we always start and end with a dad joke. And we give recommendations at the end for media we've been enjoying. So stick around for that. But if you have bad dad jokes, bad puns, please send <laughs> them away. We're always very yeah. happy to receive those. Definitely. So what are we talking about today, Anna? Today we'll be discussing season one of Interview with the Vampire, and not as I thought for decades at this point, <laughs> Interview with a Vampire. <laughs> I guess Louis is the vampire. The series recently aired its second season on AMC Plus in the US, and the show yes. is based on the book series The Vampire Chronicles by Anne Rice, the first of which was published in 1976, the last of which in 2018. And so this is spanning over four decades. Mm. Most of you will have probably heard of the movie from 1994 with Tom Cruise and Kirsten Dunst, who plays Claudia with glorious doll hair. <laughs> <laughs> and it was directed by Neil Jordan. And the screenplay was, was actually by Anne Rice herself. But we really fell in love with the show when only a couple of episodes were out mm -hmm. of the first season and we started compiling vampire lore and tropes and info so we could deep dive into this world. Yeah, it came out in October 2022 and it was the perfect Halloween show to really get into. Yeah. It was great. So yeah, we'll mostly be talking about season one in this episode, although we will probably mention some moments from season two as well to give context to season one. So just be aware there will be spoilers ahead. And just a very brief summary of what happens in season one. Mm -hmm. In 2022, renowned journalist Daniel the Boy Malloy is tasked with writing a memoir for a vampire he previously interviewed in the 1970s. The interviewee vampire is Louis Dupont du Lac, who lives with his main butler slash assistant Rashid in a Dubai penthouse. Louis' interview covers his days as a human business owner, his turning into a vampire by the vampire Lestat de Lioncourt, their abusive relationship, their vampire daughter Claudia, and Daniel trying ultimately to uncover what Louis doesn't want revealed. Mm. And season one concludes with Rashid revealing himself in a very terrifying scene. <laughs> to be the <laughs> vampire Armand and according to Louis the most bone chilling line <laughs> the love of his life <laughs> oh, yeah. That, yeah chills 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 <laughs> Yeah. It's a truly terrifying scene. It is a truly terrifying scene. Also, the <laughs> acting of Jacob Anderson in that scene is so good because you just, there's just four mm -hmm. layers of, wait, is this scary? Is this good? But, so Lily, we caught Lily on his pre read media take. What is pre read text? Yeah, so we on this podcast, we analyze media as pre read text. And the term pre read text was coined by the YouTuber Rowan Ellis for when you haven't engaged with the source material of a story or piece of media. But you have a strong sense of what it is about through interacting with various adaptations of that original material. These adaptations create a kind of cultural consciousness of the story, characters, images, concepts, etc. Which might have very little or even nothing to do with the original source material, but instead all come from adaptations that have come after. So vampires are actually a great example of this, because mm. how old are vampires as yeah. lore and fantasy and legends but how many of us have read the mm. oldest lore of the vampires we know claudia has yeah. <laughs> probably because she educated herself <laughs> every type of media that builds upon existing mm. vampire media has pre-read the text for you because mm. they're basing Things like the garlic thing, the cross thing, all of those things yeah. are a pre-read text that you come into, even if you hadn't quote-unquote read it, but you know it. Mm. So, Anna, what is your understanding of the Vampire Chronicles and Interview with the Vampire? Well, com coming into the series, what was your understanding of the Vampire Chronicles? So, I, from the Public Library board, the DVD of the 94 movie, 
which was for 16 plus and they put it on my dad's account <laughs> they were for some reason not concerned with giving i think i was like 13 they were like oh. do you want us to put this on a dad's account because we can't put it on your account because you're 13 and i was like sure <laughs> Thanks. My dad used to do that for me with like books that were slightly too old for me. He'd take them out. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, I also partly because I think he was just taking out books for me on his account anyway, because he was like, get out more books this way. But yeah. And I think it's the first Tom Cruise film that I ever watched in full. Mm. And it's it scared me for life of both vampires, this kind of movie, horror films in general, and also Tom Cruise. That was my understanding of Tom yeah. Cruise. It was not action <laughs> films. It was like this. That guy's terrifying. That's so interesting. Why do people want him to jump around with a gun? Why would anyone give that guy a gun? <laughs> That's so funny, because I think my parents didn't watch Interview with the Vampire. I was asking them about it like when it came out in the 90s. So they were like, oh, we didn't really want to watch a Tom Cruise movie, because we don't really like the kind of films he was in. And they sort of imagined it as some sort of action movie or something. I don't know. But yeah, interesting casting choice. And also interesting choice on his career, because it is the most mm. cunty mm. thing he's done, I would argue, probably. Mm. Yeah, but... <laughs> So I'm still scared of horror and I really cannot handle it. But until Twilight, I think I stayed away from anything with Creatures of the Night because of this movie. Mm -hmm. And even kids media like The Clady Vampire was really famous when I was a kid. I just remember that always on display somewhere in the kids section of the library where the comic books were. Yeah. And I never picked it up. I always thought, I know this is for kids, but this is going to scare me and I don't want that. And so even Bram Stoker's Dracula, I only watched, but I didn't read. But that movie also scared mm. the crap out mm. of me. And there's a Quentin Tarantino movie that I picked up at one point, And I'm not going to spoil it in case you know, you know. But there's also a point where like, at some point just vampire show up and I just immediately stopped it and then just watched something else. But I didn't even know that this was a book series for a very long time. I knew this was a book, mm. but I didn't know anything mm -hmm. about the Vampire Chronicles. I knew there was a book called Interview with the Vampire, but that was kind of my understanding of it. That's interesting because I feel like we were both maybe just like a slightly a generation too young or a slightly different generation to the Anne Rice generation. Because I, growing up, I was not consciously aware of the Vampire Chronicles before this series came out. But I feel like it sort of cropped up in quite a lot of media without me realising it. I'm sure, I think I was rewatching maybe the What We Do in the Shadows TV series or trying to watch the first season. And I think there's a reference, they mention Anne Rice at some point. I think it was that, really? so I can't quite remember. I think so. And I was like, this just like, right, right over my head the first time I watched this because I just wasn't aware of Anne Rice as a cultural figure or her vampires as cultural figures. But I feel like it has unknowingly impacted the vampire media I've consumed. So like, when I was growing up, Twilight was really big. Totally. Again, What We Do in the Shadows a film. And also I was aware of other vampire media like Buffy the Vampire Slayer or The Vampire Diaries, stuff like Being Human, all that kind of supernatural stuff that was coming out in the like 2000s, 2010s. But I wasn't explicitly aware of Anne Rice's stuff. That wasn't in my cultural consciousness at the time. Until I watched the show, basically. I really wish I would have been aware of it. Just a mm. female author being so big in the horror genre. Mm. I just wish I would have picked them up. And I don't think the book is as scary as the movie. I don't mm. think the book would have scared me as much as the movie did. More towards the end, I would say, not to spoil anything, there's a scene which just chilled me to my core and scared me off of getting in a car. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's when he gets you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just when he thought yeah. he was safe to drive in a car. So one of the questions that we want to ask about in this episode about Interview with the Vampire is why is it getting adapted? Why do we care about these stories? Why is the narrative so compelling? And what is the point of narrative and storytelling? So that was more than just one question. That's several questions uh, that we're hoping yeah. to answer. <laughs> but Anna, do you want to kick us off with some context around the Vampire Chronicles and what they kind of did to vampire narratives? Yeah. So very briefly, we were wondering why is something from the 70s getting readapted? Other than mm -hmm. the industry's refusal to finance anything not based on existing IP, which we know <laughs> because of the 4,000 superhero yeah. movies and like Barbie and stuff. But what makes the Vampire Chronicle so iconic? And this will be referencing mm -hmm. PBS's It's Lit series on YouTube with Lindsay Ellis. Also Princess Weeks, Ooh, two yes. video essays we love. And what did change because of Anne Rice's work? Mm. 
So before Anne Rice, you largely had the vampire as the negative monster with all the anti-Semitic, mm. anti-Eastern European stereotypes. And the monster was framed by the people who encountered the monster. And it was mm. mostly pulp yeah. literature. It wasn't considered respectable or something you read to be, I don't know, <laughs> academically expanding your mind. Yeah. And like pulp movies as well, lesbian vampire films that were very pulpy and just kind of soft porn films of the 1970s and stuff. Yeah, totally. And so Rice essentially changed genre fiction by writing this because she combined quote literary fundamentals fantasy tropes dark supernatural elements mm -hmm. and quote it tied them together she combined what's respectable with what wasn't mm -hmm. and so after the first book you have the vampire then as the complicated monster and he's relatable and layered and he doesn't only invoke empathy in the audience as the monster because mm -hmm. i would also argue the creature in frankenstein invokes empathy in the audience but the mm -hmm. monster is the one framing the actual story because the gaze is switched and i think this really really is interesting when we talk about memoir and stuff later because louis is the one wanting to interview he is controlling how he the monster will be seen and he talks mm -hmm. about this in the beginning let the story you know let the tale seduce you he is the one in control and so he's no longer primarily quote a figure of yeah fear. and i think it's also interesting because in frankenstein it kind of is from the monster's perspective but there's this kaleidoscope of different perspectives going on where it's someone telling a story about someone telling a story about someone telling a story but then that exists in Frankenstein, the novel, but then also doesn't really get adapted later on. And then, yeah, like you said, there's this then this shift with Anne Rice kind of towards this. Actually, it's the vampire and the monster who's in control of the narrative. And Mary Shelley did a lot in that as well, in terms mm. of wanting the monster to be more than just a thing you're scared of and then running yes. away. Yes, yeah. Totally. And actually thinking about how does the monster feel about this? Yeah. <laughs> because of Anne Rice, this vampire is now able to be seen grieving, mm -hmm. their losing of Claudia, half family. Essentially, Louis is married to Lestat, they're raising a daughter mm -hmm. together. Very heteronormative family, two parents, household, very traditional. Yes. Yeah, so um, <laughs> and all the bodies. <laughs> Totally. The family that hunts together. <laughs> so the vampire is sexually desirable, but also desiring. So it's not just mm. about what makes them possibly sexy, but also what do they find mm. sexy. Yeah. And I would also argue much more so, not asexual, but allosexual? Yes. Well, yeah. much more explicitly sexual mm. in the adaptations than in the book, because in the book I would argue they're more asexual mm. in terms of how they express the desire that they can possibly have. Mm. All of this, what I just said, obviously inspires everything that comes afterwards, like Twilight. Mm -hmm. The idea of a boy glistening in the sun, <laughs> a vampire glistening in the sun, you don't get that without Anne Rice. So most importantly, the vampire is now also a metaphor for otherness. Mm. and because we're not only scared of them we can use them to understand things about ourselves yeah. and i just want to jump in as well to be like it's otherness because i think they already were a metal for otherness but now it's otherness in a kind of good or relatable way it's like right, report, otherness yeah. <laughs> is the ambiguous hero rather than purely the villainous other from again like you said the human perspective the seeing the self as the other which is this kind of big shit yeah that's that's very important to note actually because dracula <laughs> is an other in the pbs series they also say that vampires are because of this now allegories for aids queerness mm. drug addiction and in the show having your blood sucked out seems to make you high and mm, yeah. yeah it's an allegory for outcasts of any sort and rice herself said quote they are the most powerful metaphor for the outsider i ever encountered which i think is really interesting yeah it's a great quote and drawing on that, thinking about the 2022 series and how it adapts those kind of themes of otherness and what's already there in the text about seeing yourself as the outsider and whose perspective it is. Um, I just wanted to bring in a bit of adaptation theory and um, a bit of Robert Feynman, who argues that um, adaptations respond to, quote, social struggle and political power and to acts of historical consciousness, end quote. So they can respond to contemporary concerns. Um, and the 2022 show very much is interested in a 2020s perspective on this stories and its themes and building on Anne Rice's work and exploring it in new and interesting ways. And I think one of those ways is how it explores queer vampires and the idea of the queer vampire from a 2020s perspective. Anna, can you explain why would people think of vampires as queer? Why are they a metaphor for queerness? Yeah, so if you're listening to this and going like, what do you mean, how are they gay? <laughs> or how could you see yourself <laughs> in vampires as a queer person? So vampires have long been seen and used as a metaphor for queerness. For example, they lead a double life, a fear of coming out or of being outed, being considered gross and disgusting for the quote-unquote lifestyle. You have the blood-sucking, which then can be also tied to the AIDS epidemic, 
their being of the night. <laughs> Mm. And also the fact that what they do is not actually a lifestyle, but it's necessary for their sur survival. Mm. And there's also ideas around coming from Edelman, who writes about the queer death drive and stuff. I'll put a link to what he's talking about in our description. But this idea that heteronormative desire and sexuality is productive and queer sexuality is destructive as its binary opposite. And then if you look at vampire sexuality, it's both reproductive and destructive because you're creating life by making someone undead. And it's also something that is not just limited to someone who has a womb. Pretty much any vampire, with ex some exceptions, can create life in this way. So vampires have that weird relationship to reproduction as well. That is a way of reading them as queer. In the movie, they don't ever explicitly call themselves anything. But Louis in the show now refers to as, for himself as queer. And Lestat mm -hmm. refers to himself as non-discriminating <laughs> in a very beautiful scene. Yeah, so thinking about the 1976 book, It's not explicitly gay, but it is quite... People have read it as very homoerotic and as being a metaphor for a marriage between Louis and Lestat. Like Anna, you mentioned earlier, with them raising Claudia as their daughter. And all of these are kind of pre-read elements, I'd say, as well. A lot of people might know about the book as being this homoerotic novel. Again, partly because of stuff that has come after as well. And the fact that in the 1980s, Anne Rice brought these novels back to life and started writing them again. But as very campy, kind of queer books and embracing the fact that people read it as a homoerotic novel in the first place. Yeah, but she also never pretended that she intended it to be that way. She wrote the book yeah, and then yeah. gay people were like, oh, this is gay as shit. And then she was like, oh, cool. I'll go with that then. <laughs> the 1994 movie does a similar thing to the 76 book where it has this homoerotic subtext and it has been read as a metaphor for the AIDS slash HIV epidemic as well. Which ties back to what you said about why men and adaptations responding to social struggle mm -hmm. in 1994 is what I mean. Very close mm. to the AIDS yeah. epidemic or just in the AIDS epidemic still. Yeah, and so against this backdrop of histories of queer vampires and then the subtext of the book and the film and then the text of the later books, we get the 2022 show. And so the show is explicitly about a gay relationship and the queer vampirism is the text and not just the subtext kind of partly similar to the book the point is to explore this queer relationship text really so louis has a lot of catholic guilt and you can see how that's linked to him struggling with his sexuality and then also kind of linking to his vampirism sorry i don't really like this phrase struggling with sexuality but like you know what i mean so but there's that scene where yeah, yeah, yeah. louis and lestat are in the church so louis just been confessing to lying with a man lying with the devil and then lestat comes in kills two of the priests in a really violent way And then they have this sort of vampiric marriage on the altar in this burning church where Louis accepts the dark gift of vampirism. And they it's kind of like... it's Drenched in blood, very traditional. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's this, yeah, really beautiful moment of vampire marriage. And yeah, and it links those two things, like Louis' sexuality and his vampirism together. Yeah. But then the show also goes further. It doesn't just give us a uh, queer vampire marriage, it gives us queer vampire divorce or arguments for it. <laughs> so like, yeah, I think the show is really interested in how queer relationships function, but also how they can be super dysfunctional as well. And how queer relationships can reproduce sort of bad slash normative power structures. I just thought it was really interesting watching the show that it doesn't shy away from the idea of It doesn't just give you gay characters in a straight narrative. It also explores mm. bad things that happen in queerness. As If you don't address mm. shit, you're just going to take all the bad dynamics into a marginalized community as well. And so you have very... This is a very yes. abusive marriage. Despite the fact that they exist outside of heteronormativity, outside of this idea that, you know, straightness is the norm, you still have the same abusive mm -hmm. dynamics within these because you still have a like, different power dynamic because you have Alistad as the maker and as the lover and a lot more powerful mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And I just thought it was interesting yeah. because they did show without they didn't pre-chew this for you but within the show they do show you that in queer relationships magically everyone isn't fixed you still have issues within them mm. they also don't do the thing which i just hate in so many shows now where they go and this is what the term bisexual means they, <laughs> they don't do that i feel like the most <laughs> they do is mm. one moment where louis goes like i've come to embrace my sexuality 
and you just go like, uh huh. <laughs> and also the moment again, like I just said, when Lestat refers to himself as non-discriminating, is the closest they come to specifically label something and explain a term. But that's not what that scene is about, because that scene is about Louis no. explaining to him, "You're French, I'm Creole." You were an outsider from Europe coming in with money. That's a very different dynamic because you're white. And when he refers to himself mm -hmm. as queer in that moment, he's not using an umbrella term. He's explaining to this yeah. that I'm a different kind of outsider in my own town than you are here. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I really love yeah. that. Yeah, I love it because it's also not meant to be educational, really. It's supposed to be about opening up those complexities. It's like, yes. here's these two men coming from very different, having grown up in very different time periods. Lestat was born in the 1700s. Louis was born in the 1800s and, and has been brought up in the this turn of the century world. And, you know, Lestat was brought up in a time where sexuality was more something that you did rather than something that you were. Whereas Louis, with the turn of the century into the 20th century, sexuality became this thing, in the Western world became this thing that was like intrinsically something that you were, was your identity rather than something that you did. And yeah, like you said, it's it's not about informing the audience of this is how you should think about this thing. It's more opening up a can of worms and then you just have to deal with it, basically. And none of these characters even know quite how to do yeah, that. Yeah, totally. And also there's still arguments that come up within this relationship in terms of their dynamic, like monogamy, talking about monogamy, talking about boundaries. They never use these words, but them fighting about who gets to draw the line somewhere is really interesting. Mm. Because when I watched it, it felt so mean to me when Louis is like, why don't you want to be monogamous with me? And Lestat laughs at him mm. hysterically. But then you think about how old he is and you're like, of course he doesn't want to yeah. be monogamous. This dude has been alive for so <laughs> long. To him, this idea of being together forever means a very different thing than it does for like, a dude in his 30s. Yeah, forever literally means forever at yeah. this point. <laughs> but again, within the show, you still have the same cycles of abuse a lot of the time. In spaces outside mm. of heteronormativity, mm. you still have domestic violence and Claudia as the kid being used to like, glue them back together. Whereas Daniel yeah. says she was a band-aid for a shitty marriage. It's still the same dynamics. Yeah. And it's really horrible how that, if you, again, if you don't address it, I think a lot of marginalized people have this idea in their head. Like, I'm a good person in a way because I'm marginalized. Like I'm able of less mm. evil mm. because I'm marginalized. That's just not true. It's just, you need to address yes. this shit. Otherwise we just we reproduce it in our own communities again. And this is one of the ways I would argue that, and we would both argue, I guess, that uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> the ways the show builds upon what's already there in the books and the movies without talking down to the audience, but still yeah. addressing a 2020s audience as opposed to a yeah. 1990s audience. Definitely, 100% agree. Another way the show builds on the book and explores it from a 2020s perspective is that it deliberately chooses to focus on black and POC vampires. Um, and just to flag as well, the book is still about race, because whiteness is a race and also a power structure, but the show chooses to move from a white lens on vampirism to a black and POC lens. So you have two key character changes in the show. So rather than being about an, an ostensibly straight white plantation owner in the 1790s, the show adapts the story to be about a gay black Creole business owner in the 1900s and 1910s. And you also have Cordia, so she moves from being a white five-year-old in the book and 12-year-old in the movie to a black 14-year-old girl. Plus also the vampire Armand, who is of Indian origin, but we won't go into him too much right now yeah. because we'll talk about it more if we talk about season two. Way too much to say. <laughs> so this is significant because it makes an intervention into dominant portrayals of vampires as white. So most of our famous and popular depictions of vampires, such as Dracula, tend to be white aristocratic men, maybe from Eastern Europe. And this is interesting as well, because this in itself is linked to a kind of, sort of xenophobia, racism around the fear of the Eastern European other. However, also the more heroic and recent vampires in pop culture also tend to be white and sometimes have anti-blackness embedded into their lore. So, for example, in the YouTuber Shan Spears' video, The Racial and Romantic Politics of Twilight Saga's Midnight Sun, she explains how Stephanie Meyer decided that her vampires can only be white because 
upon becoming a vampire, the melanin in their skin dissolves, and so it can only have a pale skin tone. And Shanspiri explores how this is allegedly rooted in a racist Mormon belief that blackness is an indicator of the sins of Cain or the mark of Ham, although this is disputed, so it's alleged, but you can kind of see the seeds that are there. It's also really fucked in the sense that in the Twilight mm. universe, when you turn into a vampire, you turn beautiful, right? Mm. Any mm. sort of blemish disappears. Yeah. Okay, what is a blemish then, Stephanie Meyer? <laughs> One yeah. of the blemishes apparently is melanin in the skin. Oh, yeah. Lots to unpack in the Twilight series. Yeah. <laughs> so I would just imagine we start coming upon the vampires of the Twilight Saga and being like, why are you all straight? Yeah. Why are you all in couples of two? This makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. However, contrary to this dominant association between whiteness and vampires, there is actually a long history of black vampire stories which have been variously used to explore racial power dynamics and critique racist beliefs. So, for example, the story The Black Vampire, A Legend of St. Domenico, which was published in 1819 by the pseudonymous Uriah Derek Darcy, was, according to Anna Walker, used as an anti-slavery narrative to challenge ideas around, quote, racial mixing and, quote, using the vampire to articulate the horror of the transatlantic slave trade. So that's quite an old example of a black vampire story. And then much more recently, we also get Octavia Butler's Fledgling, which is published in 2005. And Fledgling follows a 53-year-old black vampire who is in the body of a child. And this is like not in a Claudia way, this is in a, it's just like the way that like vampires can grow up, but their ways of growing up are different to human ways of growing up. But this vampire has lost her memory in a brutal racist attack that killed her entire family. And Butler uses this story to allegorically explore the deliberate destruction of black histories by colonial powers, the adultification of black girls, and to complicate ideas around hierarchies within age, race, species, gender, etc. Butler does a lot of things in this novel. It's a really good novel and I highly recommend reading it. Although also checking for content warnings, because a lot happens in this novel, and a lot of it's about violence and power dynamics. So just be careful. It is a weird read sometimes. Yes. And you sort of have to sit with it. Mm. I found this book because you recommended the article, I think, at the time, mm. and they mentioned that book. And I was like, what do you mean Octavia Butler wrote vampire stories? I didn't even know about that. Yeah. I just think it's very frustrating because there are black vampire narratives. Mm. You just said like 18, 19 yeah. old black vampire narratives that you they would be ready to adapt if someone gave them the budget to do mm -hmm. it. And they just never really get the big budget treatment before the series. And Octavia Butler is a very respected author. Mm. and her work doesn't get this kind of money invested. Yeah. Why not make Fledgling? Even if it is complicated, that would make it even more interesting. When, even when they made Kindred, which is her most famous mm. work, I would say, they gave the marketing no money. Mm. The only reason I heard about that show is because I read the book at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So we've had this lack of black vampire narratives or adaptations of black vampire narratives, even though they do exist, but they don't really exist in our popular consciousness. So the show looks at what happens in a vampire narrative, or specifically in the Vampire Chronicles, when the main vampires are black, and it explores the limits within the world of vampires. Depicting the racism of the time in New Orleans when the show is second place. Yeah. And you still have, in the show, for example, Claudia keeps referring to Lestat mm -hmm. as the master, point out that they're still within this dynamic of them, all three of them being vampires. Mm -hmm. Both of them are still under his thumb. Mm -hmm. They're still having a white guy in charge of everything, technically, because he won't let her leave. Yeah. So, for example, with Louis, being a black man and a vampire, it changes his relationship to society, his relationship to Lestat, and to how he enacts his vampirism. Despite being of enormous power... Louis is still made to pander to a white supremacist society and is denied respect. For example, when he and Lestat visit the opera, Louis has to stand a step behind him and to pretend to be his butler until the lights go down he can like sit with Lestat at the front yeah. of the box. Within the power that they have, they still... Yeah. Even though they could kill everybody, they still can't because they, in order to do anything, they still have to pretend that he's not... They're never equal. Yeah. And that continues. Mm -hmm. And one of the first humans that Louis kills is the Esquire for the older men because he's getting screwed over on his business with the Azalea, which is that big business that he has for a lot of season one. There's just so many microaggressions going on there. And again, trying to explain that to Lestat, he says like, well, he complimented me or something. Lestat just doesn't understand that. Yeah. And that ends up being this long con to get Louis out of his business because the white men who are the business leaders in New Orleans at the time are unhappy with him having this business and being so successful. And so eventually it leads to them, yeah, banning his business and it all going down in flames. 
which also has an impact on how Claudia is brought into the world. So in the book and in the film, Claudia is born out of a more generic guilt around Louis having to kill humans. So he, I believe, drains Claudia's mother and then mostly drains Claudia and then feels really guilty about it and is like, well, stop, please turn her into a vampire because I feel really bad. However, in the series, Claudia's transformation is a result of Louis killing an influential white man and this sparks this massive retribution against New Orleans' black community. So Claudia is then born out of Louis' specific guilt around triggering this white supremacist aggression. Which is quite the scene to watch, I would say. Mm. If you ever think that you're going to get bored in season one at any point, once they start becoming vampires, then they are a couple. The second they start fighting, Claudia appears on the scene. Yeah. Yeah. And so adapting Claudia and how she comes into the world and her being a black 14-year-old vampire, this adapts the key themes that surround Claudia. So in the book, Claudia represents a specific form of vulnerability and being old beyond her years. So in the book, Claudia is five years old um, and she's based on Anne Rice's child who died of leukaemia. Her name was Michelle. In Matt Baum's video about interview, he talks about how the Rices said that their daughter knew things beyond her apparent years, as Michelle experienced things her parents never experienced, such as these medical appointments and the knowledge of her oncoming death. And this is how Claudia is represented in the book, as this vulnerable doll-like child, but also she actually has the mental age of a 50-year-old, and kind of the horror of Claudia comes from this combination of her vulnerability and her great age as well. Which also ties into the gothic mm, yes. style stuff quite a lot because Anne Rice's writing is so neo-gothic mm-hmm. of the horror of a dull, like, five-year-old that's got the life experience of a 50-year-old. That's creepy. Yeah, definitely. But then the series imagines Claudia, who is played by Bailey Bass and Delaney Hales. They're both fantastic. It imagines her as a young black girl on the cusp of puberty. Her portrayal in the show explores this simultaneous infantilization of Claudia and her adultification as a black girl, both of which strip her of power and are weaponized to justify abuse against her. So, for example, the vampire Bruce sexually assaults Claudia, both because she's vulnerable, because she's a child, she's weaker than an adult vampire, but also because he views her as sexually mature, even though she is in the body of a 14-year-old. Like, he can argue to himself later on. Yeah. She was like, she was sexually mature. Yeah, and she always gets treated, even in the household. I mean, she's infantilized, and Louis and Lestat, even when she's far beyond a girl, she's still their daughter and must obey what they tell her to do. No, but that's true. They kind of kind of cope with her growing up mentally. Mm. And this also adds layers to her as a doomed figure. So according to vampire lore in the Vampire Chronicles or in the TV series, turning your child vampire is forbidden as they'll be unable to hold their power and it's kind of thought that they'll eventually burn out when they just like can't hold the power in a too small form. And so Claudia is positioned as a doomed figure by vampire lore, also for the viewers by the way the narrative is structured. So we have these pre-read assumptions of Claudia as a doomed figure because of the book. And it's kind of set up from the first time Claudia is mentioned. It's, well, her diaries are here, but where is she? And we know that she's probably dead or she's died in some way. This is kind of skipping ahead to season two. But those around her also view her as this doomed figure. Louis complains that she can't be satisfied and that wherever they go, she's always unhappy. And the one common denominator here is her. So it means that it's her fault that she's unhappy without acknowledging how poorly she's treated wherever she goes as a young black girl and a child vampire. And it's only Madeleine, who, again, is a season two figure, but she questions this new doomed narrative by suggesting that Claudia can find ways to deal with her latent anger and carry on. It's interesting, the comment that she can't be satisfied, because Lestat also makes a similar comment yeah. on her having a teenage, what's it, a diet, yeah. a t- teenage desire to satisfy her blood is permanent mm. now, he says. Yeah. And yeah, they're arguing about it both mentally and physically again. Mm. She will never be happy with whatever we give her. And she herself says that she needs to drain two souls a day, which I don't know what the normal diet is for a vampire, but that sounds like a lot of people. Yeah. But she's constantly from the very beginning, even though she didn't choose mm. this, is always argued to be too much, despite the fact that she's so little. Yeah, exactly. And all of this is in relation, like she's treated in a very particular way because she is a black girl and the way that she's adultified in those ways while also being infantilized. Because of the misogynoir. Yeah, because of the misogynoir. 
So through these examples, we can see that the TV series explores similar themes to the book, but kind of through a different lens by focusing on the black and POC vampires. In the same way that Anne Rice changed the gaze to the monster, the show now changes it in the sense that the gaze goes to the black people as the monsters. And I saw a Jacob Anderson Red Carpet interview where he talked about how nice it is that it's not just vampires, but they're like, not good people. <laughs> So more layers for the actors to play with. And it's from like a lot of it is from Louise and Claudia's perspective. Yeah, definitely. So it's not just because as we talked about before, the vampire has been a figure for otherness and a figure of fear, and as is the monster, and often that can be a racialized fear. But because it's from Louis and Claudia's perspective, you get these nuances and these ways of looking at these quite problematic characters, but as humans and not from a white lens. Yeah, although the writer's room, at least for season one, was a mostly white writer's room, which is worth flagging, I think, as well. So also talking about the book and the movie is you start with the interview in in this like room with the boy. And what did the show change in terms of the framing of how the entire conversation is happening? Because initially it was a short story of Anne Rice wondering, like, what would it be like to interview a vampire? Like, what would he say? What would he talk about? So how is Roland Jones, the showrunner, building upon that initial idea. And I just want to bring in a bit more adaptation theory. Sorry, this is quite a lengthy quote from Julie Saunders, but I think it is quite relevant. So I'm just going to quote this. Please bear with me. Go for it. Go for okay, it. <laughs> so, quote, The adapting text does not necessarily seek to consume or efface the informing source or intertext. Indeed, it is the very endurance and survival of the source text, alongside the various versions and interpretations that it stimulates or provokes, that enables the ongoing process of juxtaposed readings that are crucial to the cultural operations of adaptation and the ongoing experiences of pleasure for the reader or spectator in tracing the intertextual relationships. It is this inherent sense of mutually informing play, produced in part by the activation of our informed sense of similarity and difference between the texts being invoked, and the connected interplay of expectation and surprise that, for me, that is Saunders, lies at the heart of the experience of adaptation and appropriation, end quote. So basically what that means is there's this pleasure of adaptation. One of the pleasures of adaptation is seeing these similarities and differences between the source text and like the adaptation of that text and the expectations that you have around things that you want to see for that adaptation and then the surprises that can come from adapting it in a different way. And... I think this is true for interview and how the show changes things from the source material to make it interesting. But also, crucially, how the source text and by extension the 1994 film as a faithful adaptation of that source text is consciously juxtaposed in the show, which allows for a really interesting exploration of memory and narration. We've all experienced this, I think, because again, if you watch the movie, what's true and what's not mm. true, and he talks about crucifixes and garlic and yeah. stuff, even that is talking about the, mm. I mean, I know this is about adaptation theory, but again, talking about pre-read text in this context as well, the joy of getting even addressed the things that you expect from a vampire yeah. narrative, right? And then the joy of what is similar and what is different, like you just said. And that that is not necessarily a negative thing, but that that creates joy in the audience. I think that that's so true because even when you watch, I don't know, what we do in the shadows or something, you do sort of want to see certain things. Mm. Or even when he interviews him, sorry, I'm just thinking about this, but like the boy saying, can you show me the fangs again in season two? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? As is the audience, we do want to see the tropey, pulpy stuff. Definitely. It's really cool. And making that a key feature of this adaptation is the kind of like juxtaposition yeah. between the interview where something happened and this new interview where something different is being explored and what that means. And so Dominic Noble says that when Anne Rice was writing the follow-up novel, The Vampire Lestat, she apparently comes some of the things that Louis said about Lestat and some parts of their relationship just by saying basically that Lou was an unreliable narrator and you can't trust what he said in that novel, <laughs> um, which kind of is one of the ways, amongst other things, it allowed her to make the later books explicitly gay. But, and she was like, oh yeah, that, that was their relationship in this book. And the reason that you didn't know about that was because Louis wasn't telling you the truth. And the show does a similar thing, except it's still Louis telling the story. Yeah. When you watch season two especially, but it's season one as well, you just have to understand that everything you're seeing, everything you're seeing is what Louis is telling you about what happened. And even Claudia, even though we have her diaries, there's an entire episode 
which is mostly just Daniel, the boy, reading Claudia Cyrus. Mm -hmm. It's like only through what Louis Normand letting us see, because it's the archive of Claudia, but they have edited it. So even that is not necessarily what Claudia herself would want you to read, because you don't know, they could have omitted an entire diary. Yeah, and by using this juxtaposed framing, the show uses this to explore themes of narrative and memory and finding the truth within that. And the quote, memory is a monster, is quite a key one to sum up how the show feels about memory and about narrative and the difficulty of finding that truth in something that's very emotional for you. And, and when a number of factors are causing that, it to be really difficult to find a truthful narrative within memory. I love the fact that they made memory is a monster the theme of the show. Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't have to have seen the movie. But if you remember the movie, whenever they reference the interview from the 70s, you could pretend that that's the movie in the back of your head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so the show uses the movie slash the book as what happened in the 70s within the show. So we always have the 2022 interview pitted against the 1970s interview. And like Rice did with the vampire Lestat, it's a way to make, amongst other things, the original story explicitly gay by saying that Louis was just in a real mood with Lestat in the 1970s, which is why he didn't emphasise their romance. Also, we don't ever hear the original interview, or we don't hear much of it, when it all kind of comes from either a pre-read text understanding of it from the book or the film, and just suggestion within the show. I think we do hear Daniel from the 70s screaming, you don't even understand the meaning of your own story. Yeah. I feel like they have that in season one already. <laughs> Oh, they do. Yeah, they definitely do. But we get snippets of what happened, but it's not like you sit down at the start where you just listen to the whole interview. We get more of it in season two, but a, a lot of it is based on a pre-read understanding slash we know that Daniel got attacked. We know that Daniel's like, this story really doesn't match up to what you said this other time. And that Louis is kind of like, put it in the bin, burn it. I don't want to think about it. But I guess it works, even though it is slightly different. Or we find out in season two that the interview in the 1970s did work in a slightly different way to the book interview and the film interview. It's like slightly. having that period of understanding. Yes, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Quite in, in quite big ways. But it still informs our understanding of what that interview was from knowing this source material or having some understanding of the source material, which makes it pleasurable to then be like, oh, it's, it's different and all, oh, but it's sort of similar in this way. I feel like there's a lot less substances in the... <laughs> In the book and in the movie. Yeah. I mean, in the movie, they're smoking. They're smoking in the movie. What? Who knows what was in the cigarettes? Um, yeah, it does take a difference. It's perspective on what that interview could look like. But yeah, the book and film still play the part of that intertext that we still know a bit about what we don't know fully about. And maybe the fact that we think we know what it's about because we've read the book or we've seen the film. And then actually we find out later, oh, that's not quite what happened at all. That's another thing that makes it fun because it subverts your expectations. It also doesn't do the thing which we talked about before, where Shovana desperately tried to chase audience expectations. Yeah. Instead of writing it on the level of someone who's read the books, someone who's watched the movie, mm -hmm. and someone who's never heard of this. Yeah, definitely. Like it works on all levels. Yeah. Right? Like the blender mention or something. Although that might be season two, I don't remember now. No, that's season two, I'm sorry. Okay, that's alright, no worries, no worries. I've mentioned season two all over the place. So I think that the choice in how the show is adapted also relates to the storytelling of the characters and what they hope to achieve, as we touched on slightly in that segment. Mm -hmm. So Louis is presenting a memory, building upon it, and, well, he says that he is doing it right this time. And the show asks, where is the true story within these fragments being funneled through this very particular and arguably very unreliable perspective? Or, no, definitely very unreliable perspective. One of the strongest assets of the show is how they use the boy. And I did look this up again, he's never named in the book, but there is actually a character in the book, a slave, called Daniel. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, because I was like, wait, was there Daniel in the book? I'm just <laughs> going to check again. And there is, but it's not the boy. So they use the journalist brilliantly in the show mm -hmm. as the audience surrogate, pointing out discrepancies and also being used as comic relief. Like you're watching Claudius dealing with being a vampire and then he, you cut back to Dubai. I just love the fact that he's so sarcastic. 
use our brought down also to reality a little bit because <laughs> at least in my viewing experience I then live in their mm-hmm. type of them killing every day doesn't bother me and then you cut back to Daniel pointing out this uh, this is still a parasitic existence pointing out the fact that they're still yes. killer machines and now in 2022 Daniel is just so much older and more experienced in his work and he knows to call Louis out because Louis has already tried to decide what genre or, or like yeah. happened here instead of giving him all of the information and then letting Daniel write the story because Louis tries passively to write this because he knows that he failed Claudia yeah but he's passively we were arguing about this forever but is he mm. doing this because he wants someone to tell him like no 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 it's okay you're remorseful enough or something <laughs> Also, Daniel brings back in that human perspective because everything's like, it's all, it's all vampires, vampires, vampires. Yeah. And then Daniel's <laughs> like, and here's the human perspective on this. And it's sort of, it's interesting because it's that kind of sudden shift of like, oh yeah, she is killing loads of people. But how do you balance that in your head when you're trying to root for this character? But also she has to kill people to survive or does kill people to survive. Yeah, he, he's a very good audience surrogate, like you said. And Daniel also calls out Louis trying to control the narrative in terms of Claudia's story. Mm. He cuts out pages in twice, once with the sexual assault with Bruce. And mm. then another point, like when they get to Romania, they talk about that in season one already. In terms of Louis editing out Claudia's own memories and how fucked up that is. This happened Mm. to her. This is horrible. But she chose to write about it. She could have just not written about it. And he chose to alter her record of her own memories. Yeah. And how much of that is really care and how much of that is just control. Yeah. Daniel was pointing out to Louis that whether intentionally or not, Louis is using Claudia here as this tragic climax of his vampiric existence up until now. Mm. And he talks about how the audience, again, this is what we talked about in terms of making these things in different times. He's talking about how the audience will exploit the, quote, girl who moved a million books. Because nowadays, I feel like we're hopefully a little bit more aware of what the world will do to a narrative of a little black girl within Mm -hmm. the story and how if Louis decides to put her out there in this book, like what they do with her in terms of marketing her and merch and everything, Louis cannot control this Mm -hmm. because capitalism will step in. And I also think in terms of Louis wanting to control his narrative once it's been released, in a meta way it's also kind of funny because Anne Rice was notoriously against fan fiction and she would like yeah. bring lawsuits against people who wrote fan fiction because she didn't understand it and thought it was people trying to mess with her work and steal her work and then it's sort of like Louis is taking kind of a similar stance upon to preserve his control of the narrative and Daniel's like sorry this isn't really how it works once you put it out there people will do stuff with it for better or worse I was just like actually that feels a little bit like an Anne Rice reference it is truly well when she died there were people publishing fan fiction that they wrote in the 90s wow old old ass stuff was then brought out of the woodworks being like i can publish this now because she won't sue me now not that she's the ultimate villain here or whatever but i, I truly also think that she just didn't understand mm-hmm. that this was not a negative thing for her work yeah definitely and this idea of preserving this kind of memory and controlling it what Luis is doing he's sort of acknowledging it to a degree he is saying claudia was my redemption but at the end of the day claudia as an as an individual as a person never existed to him Mm. he never chose her over Lestat he never Mm. chose her over anybody yeah and it was never really about Claudia herself as an as her own person as her own desires her own dreams and plans for a future and Daniel also brings in the 2022 perspective on domestic violence Mm. that you wouldn't have gotten in the 90s movie or not as explicitly and he calls out this trope that we know and Daniel says he only beat me one time officer it's not his fault and he uses therapy speech <laughs> saying that he's because as a doctor in the room and he was like classic Stockholm a doc arguing that this is Louis because Louis specifically says he is not a victim mm. and Daniel's calling this out as what this was, was which is a massively abusive mm. relationship between the two of them and then Daniel points this out and then also as an audience member you have to question what does this mean in the context of vampires vampires who have lived for such a long time where like In the universe we see anyway, a lot of abuse happens. And so how do you then quantify that down in some manageable way? Or can you think about that in human terms? Or in what ways can that be helpful? But again, he's bringing that human perspective that definitely wouldn't have occurred to, obviously hasn't occurred to Louis. But Louis is also arguing this in order to pat himself on the back, Mm. right? He says, can we forgive ourselves if we do not... God. Ah, I said the quote like 4,000 times, I can't remember it. But like, he talks about forgiveness and... Are we the sum of our worst moments? 
Yes. And I knew that from not even having seen season two, but I knew that he wasn't just saying that to forgive you the start. He was trying to cover <laughs> his back for other shit that he's done, being like, yeah. are we really the sum of our worst moments? And I'm like, are you talking about the start here? I'm talking about you. Yeah. <laughs> but again, talking about the character of Daniel, he's just so funny. The amount of times where you just see something super fucked up in the show mm-hmm. when Louis technically like about to eat his nephew and then he goes like, did you eat the baby? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah, he cuts to the point and doesn't let stuff like that off the hook. And it's just, it is very funny because he also just is coming at it from a kind of slightly like, he's trying not to get too emotionally involved with it as well. He's like, what are the facts though? You're getting very, this is very emotional, but what are the facts? Did you eat the baby? And just pointing out how much our memories are now retrospective on what we think makes sense in the story as opposed to what actually happened. Mm-hmm. Like Louis' supposed aversion to violence. Yeah. That he was never going to be a natural at hunting. Yeah, and I, I think that's such an interesting one where the whole point of Louis as a character, again, one of those pre-read things that you may know about Louis from the book is that he's supposed to be this human vampire and he retains this kind of humanity where he doesn't like to kill. And he kind of keeps up this image as well during the show. And, you know, he's like, quote unquote, vegetarian vampire where he doesn't eat people, he eats animals instead. But then we see in the final episode of season one, you know, given the chance, he commits a lot of unprovoked violence with absolute relish. When they have that party and they go on that hunting spree within the house and he tears someone's jaw off and seems to really enjoy this violence and relish in it. And at that point, what do we believe about Louis? What he's telling us from this front he's putting on in the 2020s that he's, you know, this very civilised vampire or this version of him that we're seeing from the 19... I can't remember, but like in his... The 1950s? 19, 1940? Maybe. 1930s? Yeah. Early 20th century when... Yeah, yeah. let's go with that. <laughs> that's definitely what it is because it is pre-World War II. Mm-hmm. And what do you believe from that? And kind of, yeah, how, how do you believe a narrative when he is, there's clearly so many discrepancies in it? Yeah. Throughout the series, the way that they wrote this, I think is so brilliant mm. in season one in terms of how it builds upon itself. Because it starts out with, like, was it raining, Louis, to that coming back in the season finale, and Daniel pointing out over and over again what actually happened here, and how much is Louis kidding himself, and Mm -hmm. how much is Louis trying to lie to Daniel. Yeah. And you have, in the 1970s, you have, like I just said, like, the, the, you don't even understand the meaning of your own story, man, type thing. And then in 2022, (laughs) you have this guy in the 70s going, mortality beats a heavy drum. He has a totally different perspective mm. on love of life because he's lived a certain amount of time. Yeah. And he calls out that Louis is trying to sell him a lot of bullshit. Mm. And the show is building so much about Daniel, making Daniel early 20s in the 70s interview. And he was dropped out of his mind and he was inexperienced and enthralled and fascinated by this monster. And now he's just... He's giving the show levity by being meta and referencing Superman when they talk about the cloud gift. Mm. And he calls them existential whiny queens, <laughs> them as a couple. And it's so much grounding for the show that's so fantasy, right? Mm-hmm. I just love the fact that he has so little admiration at this point for the never maturing, yeah. both physically and a lot of ways mentally, Louis. Mm-hmm. And he sa- calls us out and he says, 144 years of life and you're still Louis the pimp. And he's just calling out that Louis, Louis is so much like Edward in a way. He thinks that he's morally superior to yeah. others because he's like not doing, we keep saying this, but he's not like the other girls. But like, you're just as abusive and as violent as any of them. And you think because you're not as nihilistic about the morality of it as a start would be, it makes you a better person, but you still do the same evil shit. Yeah. And so you don't have the young naive fascination anymore. Because he's no longer the hungry wannabe journalist and Daniel is more and more like, I'm too old for the <laughs> shit kind of personality now. Yeah. And he just wants some money to leave behind for his daughters and he knows his career is over. And the show shows this memoir as an interview that tries to get to the truth of a person who, like we said, desperately wants to reaffirm that he's so aware of himself, mm. of like how he felt his daughter and isn't it so tragic as opposed to just he could have just not failed his yeah. daughter. But then what do you do? How do you sit with that? And then how do you create a narrative out of that? Yeah. And he wants to share this wisdom because Louis says this book needs to be the warning mm. as much as anything else. 
And he probably also wants to be absolved of the guilt, which we're going to get to later. I also had one thought that I just also wanted to jump in with, but this isn't something that we've explored much in detail, but I wonder if this is also about how multiple people form a narrative. Like, it's not just Louis sitting and saying this is what happened. There's always, because he's got that relationship with Daniel, that always changes how the narrative will come about. And also because Daniel changes between the original interview and and the modern day interview, that there's so many different factors in what goes into creating a narrative and trying to find truth and all these different things that form how the narrative is framed. I guess it's kind of a bit about that as well. It's also about capitalism, because what kind of book gets the money to be printed, right? Mm, Yeah. And it's also about writing is rewriting, because whether Daniel destroys Mm. the tapes or not, you're still writing based on what this dude told you in the 70s. Okay, so moving into thinking about whose story gets told and how, as well as the interview framing device, the show explores different narrative styles as well as character voices to dig into the themes of truth, memory and narrative, and it poses the question of what does narrative mean in the context of immortal vampires? So what does telling your story do? Why does Louis want this memoir written in the first place? Anna, can you tell us a bit about what memoir is as a genre and how it is used in the show? We just kept going back to this question, right? When we were watching the show, why would you want a memoir in the first place? What would you get out of that as a character? And then we were like, okay, what is a memoir specifically? So obviously the name itself comes from memoir in French, which means to remember. And again, the theme of the show is memory is a monster. And so the whole point of a memoir would be a framing of one's life to tell a story. And I think about this a lot in terms of scandals and the rumors about celebrities and stuff. Like human lives don't fit into a narrative structure. You have to make that up because human life doesn't exist in arcs. We don't have a climax. There's no like conclusion to things. Yeah. Because we are not fictional. <laughs> we are not narratively logical yeah. as human beings. And I would argue that's why so many biopics suck. Because it's very hard to put a human yeah. life into a certain structure in terms of arcs and climaxes and things. Definitely. And if you want to do that, then it requires heavy editing. Yes. You either have to pick a certain moment in that person's life that fits into that narrative, or you have to, like, lie. Yeah. Or just omit a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and not very good narrative. Yeah. And one of the earliest memoirs that's given us an example online is the Gaelic Wars, which I think is really funny because we translated those in Latin class in grammar school. <laughs> and it's interesting because we were taught at school not of this is a memoir, but that Caesar wrote this because he wanted needed more weapons. So again, mm. this is like thinking about why do you want this written? What do you want the audience to take away from this? Yeah. In that case, he wanted more weapons. Um <laughs> But because of this, memoirs are for dictators and legacy and politicians. In America, people tend to write memoirs right before they run for president, for example, because that gives them a certain type of publicity that they want. Mm. But it also humanizes you to people because you get to tell a bunch of funny stories of when you were a kid and you broke a leg or something. Like That's that. interesting. It's interesting that it humanizes you as well, given that like yeah. Louis is holding on to trying to find some human morality within his vampire existence and just having a really hard time of doing yeah. that. Yeah. And- Daniel is constantly calling that out. Actually, you can't put human morality onto this because it just doesn't work. You can't really put human morality onto Claudia because she kills lots of people, and so do you. So yeah, interesting that he's trying to humanize himself, potentially. Yeah, and Daniel says that he's just a legacy that's for board members and assholes and loafers. But this is the mm. season one finale is so good. It's so good. It's so well written. But Louis is riddled with guilt. He's trying to make it all make sense. So he might get some relief from this. Maybe he got to the point where he couldn't hold it in anymore and he needed to share this, and obviously not with Armand. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, and I guess by making your life into a narrative, arguably that's a way of giving it meaning. Like you said about, like, you put it into a narrative and suddenly it becomes a story with a beginning, middle, and end, and there's some sense to it. And it's interesting, right, that one of the reasons that vampires don't end up living forever, even though they can, is that often the the oldest vampire is 500 years old, even though vampires have lived a lot young, longer than that, because their brains can't cope with the fact that they're living for this long, and they end up throwing themselves on the fire or killing themselves in some way, because they just get really lonely and really bored, And because living forever is really difficult. And I guess then that means it comes back to that question of, or what Daniel says, that like, you don't even understand the meaning of your own story. I think for Louis, that's the point. He doesn't understand the meaning of his story and he desperately wants to. 
because he just feels so hopeless. They keep mentioning that either lonely and he both deducted that they seem to constantly do things because they're bored. Yes. Some excitement in their life needs to be the thing that keeps happening and then they use that to either abuse people or just make some really, really dangerous decisions. Yeah. So I guess actually Louis writing a a, a memoir is probably one of the healthier decisions he's made in his life. Mm, maybe. Uh, questionable, but... Uh, no, that's a good point. <laughs> he could have just done something much more dangerous and reckless. Yeah. I guess. So, uh, Ramond... Uh, Armand as Rashid (laughs) he points out that this is essentially a suicide note because if this gets published they're going to climb the walls and they're going to climb the building but is Louis creating a legacy that he just doesn't want to live anymore because he's so isolated in this weird ass coffin or is storytelling him sharing the story and making it true and not just shouting it into the void because he could just create a thread on Twitter yeah I guess maybe he's like I need to kind of find some closure for myself and then once I've done that I can just end I can end it um do you, but if you have that much money and that much power, why yeah. do you actually care what the world beyond you thinks of you? Mm. It makes sense for, I don't know, celebrity in their 70s to be like, this is my story and actually I never got to tell it. You're you're going to live longer than that. So why do you care? And is it the constant threat of other vampires possibly coming to get you so you mm. could just die at any second? So like, age is meaningless in that sense because you'll always be at an age where you could possibly be attacked at any moment mm. or is, yeah. is it because your entire life as a vampiric existence is linked to violence mm. because you need to destroy in order to keep living and again this is so confirmed in season two but he's so deeply capitalist like is this his tie to want a library named after him is this his version of this he wants something that's built to last in a weird mm. way like he yeah. wants like the printed word to be out there that someone like him exists. And then you could also again see this as a metaphor for queerness because he's coming out to the world as himself in this book. Yeah, and sort of performing himself to people. He says that the tapes are an admitted performance, this 1970s tapes are an admitted performance, and he's aware that he's creating a persona of himself that he's trying to sell to people because literally he's selling a book to people. So yeah, I guess he just really wants to be liked. And speaking of books... Yeah, speaking of books, um, yeah, I also wanted to touch on Claudia's diaries, which they're not quite memoir, but they fall under a similar category. Through writing her diaries, I'd argue that Claudia is building a personal and social identity. The only vampire who is like herself, the only child vampire, especially growing up as well, she doesn't know, she only knows Louis and Lestat. And also in a world that is so hostile to her as a black girl and a vampire, writing her diary gives her a power over her narrative that she lacks in real life. So, for example, Louis chose for Claudia to become a vampire, Lestat turned her into a vampire and then is really controlling of her life, and Louis is also controlling and manipulative in a slightly different way, and refuses to go with her when she tries to run away. But she takes control of who she is as a vampire and her narrative, even while she lacks a lot of power, through her writing. Also, Lestat refuses to tell her about vampire history, and sort of skipping to season two for a bit, we learn that vampires aren't allowed to write their history, which is kind of obvious, especially within the context of season two, you see it as this method of control. And it's interesting that Lestat doesn't actually ban her from writing her diaries, given that that this is one of the main laws of vampirism, and that it has been used previously as a tool of control over like a coven. If you can't read and write, then you're sort of more, you have to, the person who is in charge has more power over you. But he does, in season one, overstep her boundaries Mm. as then reads them as well. Yeah. Because one of the ways that he's kept out of those two is because he cannot read either one's mind. Yes. So they can communicate with each other in a way that he cannot access. So while he doesn't ban her from writing in the diaries, he does read them. Mm. And he doesn't have... Now I'm thinking about what you were saying. I'm like, maybe he doesn't respect her intellectually enough to care enough what she could possibly write down. Do you think that's a possibility? Yeah, maybe. He underestimates her and doesn't see this as a threat because he maybe thinks that he can keep controlling her. Like the way that he just believes that he can always beat her at chess and he just has this assumption, or at least the way at least the way he presents it, but we assume that he has this assumption that she just can't beat him at chess because he's lived much longer than her and she's just a child and how could she beat him? And then she does end up beating him and 
yeah, he constantly underestimates Claudia. He sees, sees her like everyone else does in a way. She's a little black girl, as in like something that gets to be sexualized, but nothing that he has to ever respect, especially mm. not intellectually. Yeah. Which is yeah. how she ends up beating him. Yeah. <laughs> in season one. But yes, writing and banning that and having any sort of archive is such a big feature of authoritarianism and power. And also links to the fact that Obviously, the archive, as we know it, is not a neutral thing. And what that means is that Mm -hmm. materials and histories that are preserved, there are decisions that go into whose histories are preserved and whose histories are retained. And historically, for example, the histories of enslaved peoples and colonised peoples have been erased or deliberately removed from archives or not collected because of those in power and power structures determining whose stories are preserved in those archives. And this in a way links to Claudia's disconnection from vampire history and her desire to find that vampire history. And she searches for this history in human archives, but they only portray vampires from a human perspective and are mostly either pulp, as you said before, or kind of like legend. They don't have an Anne Rice. No, there's no Anne Rice. (laughs) (laughs) So she really searches for that history, but also through her writing, Claudia is creating her own archive and writing herself into this narrative that deliberately raises her on so many different levels. She does look for herself even in human existence, mm. the way that queer people look for themselves between the lines. Like she, one of the most famous Emily Dickinson poems, right? She was so obsessed with death and she yeah. talks about how in the show, Claudia seems like, no, 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 she was a vampire in the way that we see historical records of people who slept in the same bed for 40 years and <laughs> wrote, wrote letters to each other of how much they love each other. And we're like, oh, those were people were queer. But what you said about their current looking for herself and how that's tied to the lost histories of enslaved people and colonized people. Mm. In the United States, like the slave narrative is a really important literary mm. genre yes. because it is the autobiographical account right of the slave talking about the experience Mm. but it also ties into what you said in terms of the lost history of not having the connection because of the slave trade Mm. to where your ancestors are from yes Mm -hmm. and what happened from there to here and what that history is that's such a big part of black history in the united states and that's by making Claudia a black girl and by making Louis a black man ties so much into that. And it is really fascinating that yes. Claudia is so obsessed with finding her own history, but again, through the metaphor of a vampire. Yeah. And her trying to find it in university libraries and archives, like you said. Yeah, and creating this archive for herself by writing. The fact that that's so important to her then it emphasizes again the violence of Louis taking out some of those pages from her diaries. Totally, yeah. But And one of the interesting things with vampires is that, like, in human culture, this written word can outlive, will always out, well, not always, but like oft can outlive the human because humans at some point will die, but the written word and kind of how people interact, like legacy and how people think about the written word can live a lot longer. Um, however, with vampires, because they can theoretically live forever, the spoken word can outlive the written word. Um, and then we see that play out. Which is wild to yeah. think about, like yeah. in terms of legacy, but the spoken word could be older than a book. Yeah. Which I guess can exist in terms of oral traditions as well. But in this specific, your vo- your your personal voice can live forever. Yeah. And then Louis utilises that to his advantage by ripping out the pages of Claudia's books, Claudia's diaries. Another way of talking about these sessions with Daniel is you can frame them as therapy sessions, which... Daniel does at some point, but I'm not sure whether it's in season one or season two. And he talks about, like, this is our 10th session. But in season one, in the season finale, he specifically says, you don't need a memoir. You need a hundred sessions of EMDR. But he's calling out that Louis using him as a type of therapist, which also made us think, how else could you understand these sessions in terms of what Louis wants to get out of them? And I think tying to that as well, like these sessions as a sort of therapy, you can also frame them as a confession. So Louis is raised as Catholic and throughout the narrative you see that whenever he's at his lowest his instinct is to confess. So for example he goes to church to confess when his brother Paul dies and just before he's turned into a vampire. In season two when he first is interviewed by Daniel it kind of works the form of confession and then as soon as that's over he attempts to kill himself. And then now in one day Dubai, he's doing this again. He's confessing all of these things. He's trying to talk about 
all of the wrong things that he's done in a better or worse way. And so there's this idea that there's, there is probably some rumblings of something self-destructive to come. Whenever he confesses away his shame, a vampire turns up and Louis like self-destructs in some way. Yeah. Um, and it, I guess it links to Anne Rice as being brought up Catholic as well. And one of the things that the original Interview with the Vampire book was trying to do was think about religious and moral questioning in the aftermath of her daughter's death trying to find some morality in the seemingly immoral universe. And for a vampire, what is morality and religion for a vampire? Which is also so interesting in terms of Anne Rice's relationship with religion, mm. because we we tend to view religion either through the lens of mocking it, mm. right? Yeah. Or through the lens of oppression. But being alive and being a person of faith, it doesn't go in a straight line. Mm. And Anne Rice herself, when she was 18, became an atheist and then returned to the church in the 90s and then left again because of their stance of homosexuality. Because those books span for decades, you get to experience that through the characters as well. And Louis' constant search for morality, yeah, you could sort of also view them as Anne Rice's struggle with all of those things. Definitely. Yeah. Because in the Catholic faith, because unlike the, the Lutheran faith, confession is a one-on-one thing. But the whole point of it is that you are always doing things that are sins. Mm. There's no person who's living outside of sin because you're born with sin. But in general, the things you do, you try to absolve yourself. And the way that you do that is you need to confess to a priest specifically. Like you can't just confess to a person, but Daniel then becomes the priest for him Mm. in a way. And you then need to repent. And then you are absolved of those sins. And which is why when he's having the meltdown after his brother dies, he's confessing not just to feeling sinful right he's confessing to homosexuality Mm. to sex outside of marriage to being a pimp Mm. and so him confessing to daniel could be seen as daniel being the priest that needs to absolve him of what he did to claudia because louis feels guilty still and he doesn't know how to deal with it and so yeah it's also interesting that louis is turned into you mentioned before it turned into a vampire on the altar drenched in blood (laughs) after like what daniel very aptly calls priest aside (laughs) Yeah. And again, it ties into this question of what does Louis want out of this narrative? Like, why is he telling this story? And yes, what what can we expect to happen after he's finished telling the story? Which is a question for season three. Sorry, more season two spoilers. I wanted to make this episode because we both got so obsessed with the show because it was done so well. And we talked about a lot of things now. But let me tell you, there's just so many like things we could have like made entire episodes about, like just Claudia as a character, what they did with her. Mm. It's just so many layers of things. And I'm so glad that we got to talk. Like we had to pick certain things because we we're already recording for 95 minutes and we're going to like cut that down. <laughs> but we're so excited. And if anyone has any demands in terms of what we should talk about next in terms of that show, I'm happy to do that because season two is so much about Armand and everything. But the show is so good, and we didn't even get to, like, Daniel Hart in his score of the show is really good. Yeah, the writing is brilliant, the acting is phenomenal, and as we've been saying, in a similar way to the show Black Sails, it makes the material feel new to old fans while still creating something that feels completely original, and this is, as we said, the pleasures of adaptation, like, you get that familiarity, but also that surprise. And the way it weaves that into how the actual show works as a narrative and that kind of juxtaposition is a key element of, of the show. It's, it's just, yeah, it's great. It's really good. I love this show. Highly recommend it. And also the fact that they finally gave a show the money that they need to make something mm. really good is, I'm very glad about it. And I wish that more media that is this good got this treatment. And also I'm hearing, I keep hearing everywhere that season one of this is going to be on Netflix soon in the mm. US. So I'm really excited about all the new fans flooding in and getting all of their takes and just listen i could have talked for 10 minutes just about the fact that the show opens with them using the skyscrapers of dubai as teeth oh yeah you're looking into the mouth of the monster now essentially and it's like it is the memories the monster because it's the juxtaposition between these two times and these two places coming together and creating something awful because that's what that represents ah it's so good and the score in that moment is the orchestra, you know, tuning their instruments. And it's just the swelling and it's already scary even though no one's spoken yet. It's also acknowledging this is the curtain lifting. You're about to see a performance and then Louis starts. 
Yeah. Yeah. Also, this show really does something which I love. It gets better when you rewatch it because you notice more things. Obviously, there's a huge twist at the end. And someone on Twitter pointed this out. We're going to like throw this somewhere in our posts. But specifically talking about that this is a TV show, as in like they had structures for the episode, for the season. They had uh, like things to look forward to. <laughs> there's a term for this. I cannot remember right now. Cliffhangers? Yes. Jesus. Of cliffhangers. <laughs> we always have a recommendation at the end, and Lily, please start us off with your recommendation. So my recommendation is, it's an upcoming album, it hasn't been released yet, but it's Dunya by Mustafa. So there's been four songs released so far, and they're all really beautiful. Um, it's his, I think his second album, and his first album's also really good, but this one is yeah really beautiful and he kind of uses both his songwriting and his platform to he advocates a lot for palestine and sudan and so he's definitely an artist to support and also just his music is really beautiful so it looks sounds really exciting also if you like those songs then you can still look forward to like the entire album yeah really excited. exactly what's your recommendation Anna? so i've been reading about gothic literature because Anne rice being neo-gothic and i read a book yesterday <laughs> And for some reason, I thought it was pretty new because it was recommended a lot on Book Talk. It's called We Have Always Lived in the Castle. <gasps> oh, yes. Sorry. Continue. Yes, yes. Have you read this? I haven't. I started I started reading it because I had it I recommended to me by a friend and then I didn't finish it. But this was in my not finishing books phase. So that doesn't say anything about the book. I think it, it is supposed to be really good and I do really want to properly read it. It turns out it's from the 60s yes. <laughs> to 1962. It is. It doesn't feel that way, though, I will say mm -hmm. that. That's not a bad thing, necessarily, if books feel old, right? But I thought fully this was a modern day book. And again, talking about the history of Gothic, meaning we've got the old buildings and the scary castles and, you know, a lot of old churches. Yeah. Again, all the pulpy stuff. They do usually have in these types of stories. And again, I don't like horror because it just ruins my nights. <laughs> it's such a good book, and I listen to most of it on audiobook while cooking. And I really highly recommend it. It's by um, Shirley Jackson. Yeah, who is obviously very, very famous. And I had read one of her short stories before, but I just never read that book. And I highly recommend it because it is gothic and scary and but really, really exciting and good. Nice. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate us on iTunes, share our episodes, and also get in touch with us. Tell us what you thought about the series. Tell us what you thought about series two. You can find us on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter as LilianaPod, or on Tumblr as Liliana's Pre-Read Media Tech. And so, Anna, would you like to lead us out with a joke? Okay. <laughs> why did uh, Louis visit the doctor? I don't know. Why did Louis visit the doctor? He was coughing too much. Uh... <laughs>